I was just informed because Caleb faithfully sets up the live stream, which we're always live on Facebook Live, um, so that my mom can watch. Um, maybe there's others, um, but um, I was just informed that we are five subscriptions away on YouTube to also be live on YouTube on Sunday mornings. So you pull out that. I mean, I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know why we're clapping about that, other than. Um, that's, pull out your phones and subscribe. Come on, man. Yeah. Um, I don't know, is it, if you search Alma Heights Baptist Church? It should know. come up. Yeah, it should come up. But yeah, so go subscribe so that we become, I don't know, just subscribe. Uh, but you can see us live on YouTube also. Um, uh, just a couple things to throw your way. Um, this is new. I don't know if you like this or not. Some people were asking for some sort of worship guide. We used to call these bulletins, so you call it what you want. Um, but it just gives some information. The most probably be probably the most important information that's on the back of this um, is that we are now gathering together on Wednesdays again. So we do 6 p.m. dinner downstairs, and then at 6:30 ish. Uh, which I think we were really good this last Wednesday, that right at 6.30, um, the kids went to their classrooms, the youth came up to the front room, because um, from 6th grade to 12th grade, we have our youth gathering together on Wednesday nights again, um, and then adults, we got together in the fellowship hall and had our study, and so that's, I love for you, if you are available on Wednesday nights, or if you are canceling what you were doing on this next Wednesday, and you're going to be a part of um, 6 p.m. dinner and then 6.30 study, uh, breakouts for kids, youth, and adults. Also, um, I didn't bring one of these up here, but in the front, um, on the TV screen, and then I think on your way in, we, uh, Leighton and I, have been trying to clearly articulate, like, what's the path? That, 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 that if you walk in here the first time, never been in this place before, no insight as to what Alma Heights Baptist Church is, like, what is, like, like what is our goal? What is the path? That we want you to be on, that we want us to be on together. And so we've put that down on paper. We had a stab at it last year um, as we um, began the new year in 2022. And now we're re kind of um, refining it as, as what we started last year. So now we have a clear path from from first intro introductory, you're introduced to Alma High Baptist Church, and then what it means to be a member. And so we're going to spend the next five Wednesdays, starting this Wednesday, and for five Wednesdays, um, kind of introducing or reintroducing who we are as Alma Heights Baptist Church, like our history. I've said this, and I'm going to continue to say this. We turned 95 years old this year on March 18th. And so, like, how did that happen? What did that how did that take place? We had three different name changes. I don't know if you even knew that, so we're going to talk about that. Um, more importantly, what's our biblical foundation? Like, what's our, our, our statement of faith, the doctrine that, that we lean on, that we stand on? Um, what are our five Gs? Like, what are our five core components? If you were here this last Wednesday, you made me extremely proud because you were able to regurgitate to me the five Gs. Like, I didn't even have to read them. You knew them. And so, thank you for being there Wednesday. For those of you that weren't there Wednesday, shame on you. Um, but it was awesome to hear. Um, that means some of it is, is sticking. Um, and then lastly, you'll also get to, um, in, in, in the later at, at week four and week five, um, you'll be able to see that God calls each and every one of us to be a part of his mission. And so you have purpose in that. And you have gifting in that. And so how do we discover our gifting and purpose and then be used by him in this church context, in this building, but also outside these walls for his mission and his glory's sake. And so I'm super excited that we're kicking that back off uh, this Wednesday. Um, and then lastly, you see a QR code that uh, takes you to our, our, our online giving. I kind of smirk and smile and I point at Layton because he's been begging me to put a QR code. Uh, I've been kind of against him. There you go. There's your QR code. Um, and so, so yeah. Um, other than that, I think that's all that's going on. I'm going to pray for us one more time. And then we're going to jump into today's text out of John chapter 4. And so pray with me. God, calm our hearts. 
hear us in this moment as we open to John chapter 4, as we reflect on chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book of John, that you are making a pronouncement to us about yourself, and you want us to see you, you want us to know you. And so God, would we scrap any, any prior knowledge, any um, sin that we're entangled in, any doubt or fear or anxiety, would, would we leave that off the door and come and find you today, afresh, new, and then it would make all the difference. And so we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, some of you had already mentioned, why is this on the stage? Um, this is normally on the top of my bookshelf in my office. And this holds no value or no, like, sentimental value in my heart. Um, I've been at this church 15 years, and there's a lot of things that we've gotten rid of and thrown away or sold at garage sales. And this is one that it was at a garage sale that we had, like, 11 years ago. But then I couldn't get rid of it, because how do you get rid of Jesus, right? <laughs> I felt like that would have been, like, I don't normally, like, I'm not a superstitious individual, but how do you, like, justify that when you get into heaven one day? Like, you sold me at a garage sale party? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Leighton and I had a meeting on Friday, and we had two folks in my office, and this was up on the bookshelf, and somebody in that meeting was like, what's with Jesus? He's not even looking at us. <laughs> what is he looking at? But I get to wonder, right? So we've got Jesus in the stained glass there. We've got Jesus in the stained glass here. This is in my office. Maybe you. I'm going to put Jesus right here. So he's staring off into the, I guess that's what, north? He's staring north. What does Jesus look like to you? Like maybe you have a painting or an icon or some sort of mental picture of Jesus. But what does Jesus look like to you? Because the truth is, is that kind of matters, doesn't it? Or at least it makes a difference if there's even a conviction of our idea of who Jesus is. Maybe it's not a visible picture, but maybe it's a, um, a presence of what is Jesus like for me in my everyday? What is my experience with his encounter? Because that makes all the difference too. And maybe none of us think about Jesus, what he looks like or what his presence in our lives looks like. And that too makes a difference in how we live our everyday. What does Jesus look like? We started a study through the book of John, and it's super interesting because if we go back, we're going to be in John chapter 4 today, um, but if we look from John chapter 1, we get a glimpse, like John's whole um, thesis, purpose, his mission, his goal in writing his gospel account is this. We read it in John chapter 20, right? John chapter 20, verse 21. Um, there are so many more things that Jesus had done while he was here on earth. But what I have written to you, I want you to see, to know, to read, so that you may believe. And starting in John chapter 1, we see that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Like we could close the Gospel of John there and be sustained for life, knowing that Jesus came to be the Lamb of God who takes away our sin and the sin of the whole world. Thank you, God, for sending your Son. This is significant because, as Leighton preached a couple weeks ago, this was a new sacrificial system. No longer would you have to provide in a, 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 a spotless Lamb for the atonement of your sin. But the one and only forever atoning lamb gave his own life as a gift to you and a gift to me. We see that in John chapter 1. In John chapter 2, we see at the wedding that Jesus is a miracle worker. Water to wine. And the wine that he produced was what? The best. So not only is Jesus a miracle worker, a, a, a sign shower, but he is the best. He produces the best. He is the greatest. Also in John chapter 2, we see that Jesus is the temple. Do you remember what he said at the end of John chapter 2? Um, um, 
tear it down, but in three days later, I will bring the temple back. Tear it down, and the temple will come back. Jesus is the temple restored after three days. A place to come and worship a holy God is the way we stated that, or Layton introduced to us. That we have a temple that we can come and worship a holy God. But even more than that, um, Jesus then says, and we read this in the New Testament, that you are the temple. We looked over that on Wednesday, that in us, that through us, we have an opportunity to participate in coming to worship the holy God. In John chapter 3, Jesus offers new birth in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is prolific. Like it's, it is so awe-inspiring as we read from the beginning of John chapter 3 to the end of John chapter 3. We see this, this um, orientation of new life through Jesus. Knowing that you cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. In the latter of John chapter 3, we see this in Jesus. That Jesus is light. Later, John will make a declaration of uh, another pronouncement of Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. We see hints of this here when, when um, in John chapter 3, John records for us, the people in the world loved darkness, but a light has come, and that light is Jesus. To illuminate darkness in such a way that people no longer have to live life in the dark, without direction, without purpose, Muddy in their sin, broken, hurt in their sin, but a light has come. And now, as we turn to John chapter 4, we see and we get to know living water. I don't know what view of Jesus you have today, but the prayer is, is as we leave here, we have our inner thirst quench by living water. Turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, says this. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Now, um, we've been introduced in John chapter 2 and in John chapter 3 to this um, group of individuals, these group of Jews called the Pharisees, these religious leaders, these rabbis or teachers of the law. They, they were disturbed in John chapter 2 already by Jesus. They sent an individual, or an individual felt the need to be sent himself to have an encounter with Jesus. That was Nicodemus, and he had an encounter, a face-to-face -face conversation with Jesus. And now here they are again, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Verse 2, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but it was his disciples. Verse 3, so he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So um, it, it, if you read Luke, his gospel, in Luke chapter 3, verse 3, we see this. Um, John the baptizers, and remember, just we're not going to call him John the Baptist, so that we as a Baptist church doesn't like count him as one of our own. You see, the whole first century world, world was a Baptist world. No, John the Baptizer, he wasn't a member at only Baptist church or first Baptist church. This was his mission. The baptism for repentance and the forgiveness of sin. It was a primer, if you will. He wasn't the Messiah, but he was the one to be an announcement of the one to come. The Lamb of God that would rightly take away the sins of the world. But before then, world, people, Jews, Gentiles, hear this. Be baptized 
for the repentance of your sin. Jesus, I don't know if you ever talk about this, Jesus and his disciples, some of which used to be John's disciples that are now Jesus' disciples, continue to carry out this baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sin. Interesting, right? I don't know if that's something that we think about when we think of one of the things that Jesus does within his earthly ministry. And as Jesus empowers his disciples to continue this, the Pharisees catch wind. John the baptizer is not the one. Maybe this Jesus is the one. And now he is baptizing more. We need to do something about this. Verse 4. Now he, who's he here? You can say it, it's okay. Who's he? Starts with the J, and ends with the D. Yes. Jesus. Okay, yeah, don't, don't be so scared, man. I know. Uh, let's just, elephant in the room is that some of you missed out on the first Sunday of the year. That was last week. But thank you for being here on the second Sunday of the year. I know some of you are sick. I'm glad you're here. Welcome back. But we like when you talk in church. <coughs> now, he had to go through Samaria. Now, it's interesting, right? Um, You've been taught, I've been taught, we teach that he had to go through Samaria means that um, there is another way around Samaria to get to Jerusalem, right? Like there's the long way that adds one or two days or so, depending on how quick you walk. There's another way around Samaria. Jesus didn't have to go this way that he goes. It's normally what we teach or what we study or what we read in commentary. But the truth is, Jesus, yes, had to go through Samaria. You see, what John is trying to point out here is not a Google map version or commentary. Not a physical location of what Jesus was doing. Rather, what John is pointing out for you and for me is that Jesus had to go because he had to have an encounter with a sinner. That is significant because Jesus is not so concerned with the direction he takes. He's concerned with the people that he meets with. That should be reassuring for this woman that he's about to meet with and reassuring for us because Jesus is not concerned with his directions. He's concerned with meeting with you and me. We should rest in that. We should lean into that, knowing that, yes, he had to go this way. Verse 5, so we came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Verse 6, Joseph's, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the noon hour. So, uh, first thing that we pointed out was, yes, he had to go this way. The second thing that I want us to see here is um, kind of right there in the middle of verse 6. Yes, Jesus was tired. Like we sing some, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yeah, thank you, there you go. We don't sing, yes, he was tired. <laughs> but it's interesting again here, that in this moment, John is being extremely intentional to say, hey, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus was 100% God with us. But yes, Jesus was 100% man, yet no sin was in him. Like we, we need to know that because later on we read in Hebrews that we have a high priest that absolutely knows what we have to deal with because he dealt with it. The only difference that is with him is that he had no sin and we are saturated with sin. But we can trust him and we can lean on him because he knows. And John points that out here. He was tired. <laughs> T 
Tired from his journey, he sat down by this well, and it was about noon. Now, a little note on noon, which many of us know in this moment. Noon is an unusual time to be at a well. It's a bit warm in this context, right? It's a bit warm in this desert place, this arid place in the Middle East. They had to completely move the timeline of this last World Cup because if it would have been in the summertime, these soccer players, Argentina wouldn't have won, they wouldn't have survived the game, right? So they moved the World Cup to the wintertime. That's why it's unusual, this noontime at the well. Verse 7, we get two other unusual ideas about the well, because when Jesus is sitting there at noontime, verse 7 says, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her in verse 7, will you give me a drink? Unusual time, because it's noon. Strike one, she's a woman. Strike two, She's a Samaritan woman. And strike three, she's a sinner. And because of those three identifiers, she finds herself by herself at the time, at the well. And Jesus asks, would you give me a drink? Now I say strikes, not to point out that if you are a woman, just praying for you, right? <laughs> no, but in this context, a Jewish man alone would not dare talk to a woman that is not his wife or daughter. So that's what I mean by strike one. Strike two, she's not fully Jewish. She's a Samaritan. That's two. Now, now, here's the thing. So, um, when Babylon, we read this in the Old Testament time, conquered the southern kingdom, they took with not only the physical fine possessions that are worth, were worth a lot, but they also took with it its finest individuals back to Babylon as captives. The best of the best, the, those Jews who had significance to the Babylonians, they took. But those that were not the best of the best, they weren't fine individuals, they were deemed as second-class citizens, the Babylonians left them there. In, in, in a destroyed city, but they left them there. And so these lower class citizens who were left behind began marrying those who weren't Jews, who weren't from the area, who had other religious beliefs. So um, these not only lower class citizens were now of mixed race and of mixed religions, but they became their own people. And now we have what the Jews call the Samaritans. They even made their own temple on a mountainside. So you had a temple in Jerusalem that the Jews deemed as the right and correct temple. And then you had a second class, mixed race, mixed religion temple in Samaria. We're going to get to that here in a little bit. So this is the type of woman that is there at the well at noontime. But here's the third thing that I think is interesting. She's at the well because she's in need. Now, she thinks she's in need of physical water. And we're going to see that she's in need of so much more. But I wonder as we continue in this narrative that may be familiar for the majority of us, I wonder what it is we need this morning. Why are you here? 
at 11.13. Like, you could be doing some other stuff right now. Getting to H-E-B before the Sunday gosh. <laughs> Plenty of fantastic restaurants. It's a beautiful day outside. I'd be in the Pearl. Why are we here? What are we in need of? And are we truly honest enough to accept what it is that we're going to find in Jesus and to leave with it that it might make a difference for us? It's a question that John's about to point out in this woman. It's a question that you and I must ask. Will you give me a drink? And, and then in parentheses in verse 8, it's parentheses in my Bible, and, and here's something interesting. Uh, verse 8, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, um, I wonder, I wonder, um, so Jesus and his disciples had to go through Samaria, right, for this encounter. They leave Jesus at the well, which is usually outside of the city to go then into the city to get some food. And I wonder if as they, the disciples, are walking into the city from the well, notice the woman going from inside the city to the well. And I wonder if they would have looked at her and said, dang, she's got issues. I just wonder if there was that encounter in passing by. And this is why I wonder that. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, to Jesus, you are a Jew, I am a Samaritan, I am a Samaritan woman, she points out. But she knows, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You know what really caused the conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans? Is about 130, 135 years before Jesus shows up, good, faithful Jews went into Samaria and destroyed the Samaritan temple. Like that's what caused maybe one of the greatest rifts between the two groups here. Is that the Jews destroyed their temple. And she knows that, and she points it out. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Verse 11, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Now, highlight, circle, square, underline that. If it isn't already in your Bible or, or on your mobile device, you can just click it and choose a nice highlighted color. So this screenshot it. So that may be the question that we, where do we get this living water? It's the same question that when Nicodemus in chapter 3 shows himself to Jesus, what must I do? What must we do? I mean, this is the question that people, men and women, have been asking since creation. What must we do to find sustainability, to find protection, to find comfort, to, kind, to find healing and, and a freeing of our sins? What must we do? Where must we find it? We ask it today. Where can you get this living water? Verse 12. Are you greater than our fathers Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and the livestock? Verse 13. Everyone, this is Jesus answering now. Everyone who drinks the water that you brought on Cher Sunday 
we'll be thirsty again. Some of you got it because I asked you to bring water, bottled water, to put in our food pantry so when people come, not only do they get um, non-perishable soups in a can and vegetables and things like that, but now we can give them water. But the truth is, they will continue to be thirsty even after those six bottles of water are done. You might be thirsty right now because your coffee is done. And it's not as hydrating as water. Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I give will what? Never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So not only will we never be thirsty when you drink the water that Jesus provides, but a spring of water will, will, will bubble from inside of us, will, will well up from inside of us, sustaining us. And so here's the thing. After Jesus makes that statement, do you see what happens in verse 15? Verse 15, the woman said to him, to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. We could close our Bibles right here. Here's the greatest tactic for saving one's soul right here, 101. Here's living water, it's from Jesus. You will never be thirsty again, and it'll be a spring welling up from inside of you. The woman responds, give it to me, I want it, so that I will never thirst and I never have to come to this well. She answers the question, why are you here? She's at noon because she's ashamed. She doesn't come early in the morning with the rest of the women, because the rest of the women know and talk about her past. She's still in need of physical water, so she needs to come at some point in the day. And so she comes to the well, but she wants so much more. Drawing water at the noon by noontime by herself, she probably is thinking and anxiously filled inside of her heart, knowing that life is miserable as I do this by myself, and it's wicked hot. I need something else to fix this within me. And here it is. Jesus is providing it. And she says, yes, give it to me. Let's pray and go. It's not as easy as that for us at times, though, is it? And Jesus in this moment, this is so brilliant that John provides this information. Jesus wants this woman's heart mind changed by her yes but he also wants her life changed by her yes and so Jesus doesn't stop there he makes it awkward why don't you go get your husband has this ever happened to you I mean not go get your husband I mean not hello Jesus knows, right? Um, I have no husband, she replied. Um, Jesus said to her, you're right. The fact is, you have five husbands, and the man that you're with is not your husband. What she said is quite true. So Jesus goes from heart yes, head yes, to I want your life to be a yes for me. So we need to talk about this. Go and get it, and let's talk about it. I don't know what it is for you. But Jesus wants to meet with us in an intimate way to say, bring it to me. I already know about it. The fact is, you're right. I know about it. The woman responds here in verse 19, just like we respond when we're confronted. So the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. Remember, they had their own temple on their own mountain there in Samaria. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews 
claimed that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. So she is confronted with her past and her present and her future with a man that is not her husband. And it's awkward and it's hard and it's real. And so she responds by saying, um, so what do you think about Roe versus Wade about abortion? Um, what do you think about creation? Old earth, new earth? What do you think about um, um, contemporary music or hymns? Right? Like, we begin to bring these um, not so important issues that are more religious or traditional issues to, well, let's talk about these things, though. And I think that's pretty important, right? As Jesus is trying to dive so much deeper into our heart, into our mind, into our soul, into our lives. Woman, verse 20. Which, I don't know how you read this. Um, I'm reading the Bible in the year, or I'm listening to um, uh, uh, the Dwell Bible app, Bible in the Year. This is the second time that I've done this. And um, it's, it's, well, first of all, I'm reading it. Um, it. It's the guy's name. I don't know if you have the Dwell app, but you can change different readers. Um, the guy that's reading it to me, his name is David from the UK. He's got such a sweet and nice, calm voice. And instead of this being like, woman, it's like, woman. Which I want to hear that too from my Savior. Like, Bobby, the compassionate, slow to anger, but abounding in love voice. Who wants to deal with my inside? Say, Bobby, believe me, a time is coming when you'll worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, yet a time is coming and has now come. Uh, verse 23 has hints of um, the beginning of Mark's gospel, Mark 1, 15, 16, that the kingdom of heaven is now. Repent and believe. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. Verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship Highlight, underline, circle, square. Gently take it out of your Bible and put it in your pocket right here. Ready? God is spirit and his worshipers must spirit in what? Spirit. They must worship in spirit and in truth. The truth is we must deal with the truth. And that's the moment Jesus is having with this woman. That's the moment that Jesus has had already with many of us. That's the moment that Jesus desires to have with some of you. To have a face-to-face -face encounter to say, man, woman, or it's sure someday he knows our names because it's on a name tag. Right? Verse 25. The woman said, just as we know. I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. So, uh, Savior, Redeemer, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, I know He's coming. And when He comes, He'll what? Explain all of this to us. Like, I read my Bible. One day, I'll understand. Jesus declares in verse 26. So, um, I don't know what Jesus looks like to you. Um, we see, and I, I've already mentioned, um, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We need to see and know that. Jesus is the miracle maker. Not only a miracle maker, but the best. It is great what he does and has done. Jesus is the temple restored. And that born again, there is new life because Jesus is new life. Jesus is living water. And now in verse 26, Jesus declares, 
I, the one speaking to you, I am He. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. I am He. What you seek is face to face with you. I hope that helps to answer the question why you're here this morning. Because it's Him we seek. It is Him we come to give glory and honor to. It is Him we come to find rest, to find healing, to find mending, to squelch the anxieties and the worries that so plague us. We see Jesus. We see the Messiah today. Now, in closing, what do we do with this? I still feel that we're entering into a new year. Like I know we're, we're we're already in it. Like hustle and bustle through it already, right? Ready or not, it's already here. It still feels new. It still feels fresh. And, and maybe like me, you're asking the question like, what is it that I'm seeking for this year? It's like, what is it that I'm going to get out of it? What is it that I'm going to put into this new year? Maybe you're asking that. So here it is, accept and claim what the Messiah, Jesus Christ, has to offer. Accept it. Okay, if you're sitting with um, fist clenched, open them up. If you're sitting with a heart or mind clenched, open it up and accept what Messiah, Jesus, has to offer. Living water that sustains, that you'll never be thirsty again. Moreover, you will be a spring welling up into We're not going to get into this uh, this morning. Uh, but do you know what she does next after this encounter with Jesus? Because she's sustained by living water, because she's a, a spring welling up inside, she runs back into Sychar and tells everyone. Now the truth is, everyone already knows about husband one, husband two, husband three, husband four, Five and the dude that she's with now. They know. And yet she goes, I believe again, this is not given to us by John, but she knocks on every door. Let me tell you about this Jesus who is a man, who is the Christ, who knows everything that I have done. And they're saying, yeah, we do too. <laughs> but you know what they do because of that testimony? Um, they come out to Jesus and say, Jesus, will you spend two days with us? And after those three days, because it's the day that the encounter, and then the two days, right? So that's one plus two is three. What happens? They declare, those people in Sychar, we don't believe in this Jesus Christ because of you, woman at the well. We believe because we've spent time with him, and he's shown himself to us. And now we believe we have living water. We are welling a spring inside of us too. So accept and claim what Jesus has to offer because it will make a difference in your life and those around you. Your spouse, your kids, your place of work, your school. Second, Drink living water daily. Uh, we talked about this on Wednesday. Um, it is not good enough to make resolutions that are going to fail this Friday. But it's better to make a resolution the moment you wake up to drink from Jesus that he might sustain you today. And what I mean by that is that immerse ourselves in God's word. Do whatever it takes to open up or turn on God's word that we might find ourselves immersed in it, that we would drink and be sustained. Share God's word. Email, text, call, read it out loud. That we might be sustained by drinking from living water that is found in God's word, that we may thirst no more. The water, number three, that is a spring inside of us, share with others. Pour a cup for the person nearest you. Share. Living water must be shared with those.
nearest us. May we see the kingdom today, tomorrow, and this year as Jesus declares, I am He. He is Savior. He is Messiah. He is Lord. He is worthy of our hearts and our minds and our lives. Would you pray for me, Father God? I thank you that you, through these scripture passages from John chapter 1 now to halfway through John chapter 4, we get a glimpse we get to see that Jesus is significant and that he sustains our lives today, tomorrow, forever. Thank you that John records this encounter with Jesus and the woman at the well. Thank you that your plan is for Jesus having to go this way through Samaria. And what that means for us, knowing that your promise and plan is for Jesus to have to come our way too, to heal, to save, to restore, to offer new life and sustainability. And so with open hands, with open hearts, with open minds, we accept it today. And I pray if there's anyone in this room that have yet, that they are to say yes to you, Jesus, today. Forgive us, heal us, mend us, and now use us that we might share living water. Take us from here and protect us, watch over us, guide us. That in your life we may find direction and purpose as we share you with those around us. God, thank you for this place, this building that we get to gather in. God, now I pray that as you take us from here, that you would lead us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sunday again. Thank you for being here. Hope to see you Sunday or Wednesday at 6 p.m. or Sunday. Um, I'll be happy with that too. Have a great week. Bye.